plane on route to Turkey. But to me, um, this whole movie, as I already referred to it, began on the 23rd of July, it was a Tuesday. Uh, suddenly the doors of my cell had two double, uh, two sort of metal doors, uh, one on the outside and then the metal bar door on the inside, it was a particularly dangerous criminal in a solitary confinement cell. The two doors were just open, um, and a couple of prison officials walked in and told me to come with them. So they take me into uh, an office. There's a desk, a chair, a big portrait of Putin on the wall. There's a piece of paper, a pen, and some sort of a template with a pre-printed text next to the sheet of paper. And so the official told me to sit down and write what's written in the template, you know, from my own hand and, and sign my name. And this was a request for pardon, addressed to Vladimir Putin, in which I was supposed to admit my guilt, express remorse for what I had done, etc., etc. Originally, I thought it was a joke, so I sort of just laughed in his face and I said, "What is this?" He said, "No, please sign it." He said, "No, I'm not going to sign it." He said, "Why do you have to sign it?" He said, "Well, look, you have internet like me, you can Google my biography, and don't you know my name? I'm not sign it. First, because I do not consider Putin to be a legitimate president. I consider him to be a usurper, dictator, and a murderer. And secondly, because I'm not going to admit any guilt, I'm not guilty of anything. The real criminals are those who are waging this war, not those of us who are speaking out against it. So, um, he asked me to put on writing, which that I was happy to do, and I did. Signed the date and gave it to him. And then, at 3 a.m. on Sunday, July 28th, um, and I have to say that even by the standards of the Russian prison system, even by the standards of Putin's modern day gulag, almost the Western Siberia city where I was held, is notorious for its fanatical adherence to discipline. Everything has to be done by the rule book, by the paragraph, by the minute. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you undo your button, that's a violation, you get disciplinary cell punishment for that. If you remove your hand for a minute in the courtyard, that's a violation, you get that gets registered, you get punished with disciplinary cell and so on. And so, to be outside your bunk bed at night is a violation too. So when the door of my cell goes open at 3 a.m. and they barge in a group of prison officers and they tell me to get up and get ready in 10 minutes, um, I was absolutely, absolutely convinced I was going to be let up and be executed. And actually, when we shared our experiences on that plane, they came three or four hours ago at the same time. It was done in the same manner. You all know you've been woken in the middle of the night to be killed. Right. Uh, that's the way they usually do it. And nearby was attempting to escape from you know, whatever that, that, that scenery is. But instead of the nearby woods, they took me to, to the airport, just a normal, regular civilian airport in Oz. And I have to tell you, Kim, I, I don't think I have enough words to, to sort of express the feeling because. I've spent, out of two and a half years in prison, I've spent 11 months straight in solitary confinement, when you literally sit in a small cupboard, you know, two by three meters with the four walls, just staring at the wall, not being able to do as much as you was with me. And after that, <laughs> I suddenly burst in the middle of a, on the airport. No more regular airport. Families, people, you know, kids. What now? I was kind of upset. Oh, no, but we were in a normal airport. By this stage, of course, I, I realized that I'm probably not going to get executed because of the world was just down there, what's the point? But I had absolutely no idea what's going on. And so they board me in a plane, in handcuffs with the convoy, and we fly to Moscow. It's a three hour flight. Last year, actually, exactly this time last year, when I was taken from Moscow to Siberia, it took three weeks in the Stolypin train carriages, as I know, the Russian prison trains. With the transit prisons and so on, went through Samara, through Chilevins, through uh, Omsk. Uh, that was a three week journey. This was three hours, much quicker one. And needless to say, they don't usually take prisoners in Russia by planes. Something really weird was happening. Nobody explained or why or what was going on. Uh, so we fly to Moscow, I get put in the paddy wagon and driven somewhere, which they there are no windows in the study wagon, so when you sit inside your seat, you can just sit in the small confined space. Um, and so when they told me to get out, it was an internal courtyard, a yellow brick prison building, 
He didn't say where I was, but I'm a Muscovite, I know what the photo looks like. And of course I know the literature from Solzhenitsyn, and from Bukowski, from Shilansky, and so It's a legendary prison trap in case I've ever held many and celebrated opponents of the communist regime in the past. So at this point you're thinking frying pan and fire? At this point I'm thinking there's going to be a new criminal case, because that's the reason they usually take you to the court. If you are already a prisoner, and they take you from your regular prison to the photo, usually it's to start a new criminal case. And I sort of struggle to think of why on earth will they open a new criminal case with somebody who already essentially has a life sentence, 25 years. But you know, logic doesn't always work with the system. The repressive machine has its own sort of internal logic uh, to its actions. And everything looked really, really calculated. Every moment. So this prison officer, the captain, who was sort of checking me in and registering me, we had this most bizarre conversation with him. So I say, the first of all, I tried to ask, you know, where, where we are. He just looked at me and smiled. But again, I knew it was before. So I said to him, can you please notify my family and my lawyers that I'm, I've been transferred to Moscow because they're going to be worried sick? Because that's the way they always do things in the Russian prison system, you just disappear. Uh, so when I was transferred to Siberia, I was yeah, I just disappeared. None of my, you know, my wife, my kids, my lawyers, nobody knew where I actually was. And this was the same. So I said, can you please notify them? By law, you have to, so that, so that my family knows. And so this captain looks at me, smiles, and says, but you're not in Moscow, but in the language. You're still in Moscow. So, which didn't exactly have to hear things out. Right. So I said, okay. I know the rules. I've been transferred to a new prison. I have the right to go to the shop. Can I go to the shop, please? Looks at me again, smiles again, and says, but no language. You are in Moscow. So you can be taking a shower in Omsk. So I said, so presumably the walks in the courtyard will be in Omsk as well. I said, yeah, you're absolutely right, they're going to be in Omsk too. <laughs> and then I said, and excuse me for the, for the language, but I said, uh, well, can I go to the toilet here? Is that going to be in Omsk as well? He said, no, that's fine, you've got one in yourself, you can, you, can go, you can go to the toilet here. So they take me to uh, one of the social and find myself, but I have to say the photo was like, was like a hotel, like a resort, out of prison Omsk. Right? I, don't, I know how that's going to come out sounding, but I enjoyed my time there because, I mean, in Omsk, uh, I had to fold my bark to the wall at 5 a.m. After that, all you can do is either walk around a small cell, you sit at a really small and comfortable stool. Um, you get, everything gets regulated. As I mentioned, uh, you, you can only have pen and paper for 90 minutes a day, one and a half hours, and they take it away again. And essentially, you just sit and stare at a wall uh, for, 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 the whole, for the whole duration of the day. So your travel guide to Russian prisons would say this was not great. Oh, this was definitely not okay. This was a five star by uh, the Russian prison system. And then, by the way, actually, if you read about the photo in, in, in memoirs by Soviet, they said they said the same thing. So that was a case by the Soviet time. So I had a bed. I could lie there. Nobody cared. I had my notepads and pens and books. Nobody cared. I wasn't limited in what, you know, how long I could read or write. Um, and how long did this go on? Five days. Uh, and, uh, and nothing happened. So I, I thought this was, you know, this was a new criminal case, but if it's a new criminal case, you're supposed to be interrogated. It's supposed to be, you know, some people coming in to talk to you. Nothing was happening. I was just sitting there and so on my own, uh, in a complete vacuum. And then, um, on the morning of August 1st, and this is the answer to your question again, when, when I mean, and this is the, the case with all the others, on the morning of August 1st, uh, the deputy director of the court, the lieutenant colonel, walked in with the same captain who was registering me in. They were all my bags. And they said, um, take off your prison uniform, put on whatever civilian clothes you have. And I said, well, all I have from my civilian clothes, I have basically, you know, a, a t-shirt in which I slept, um, black underpants too, because I'm so as you get really cold inside here, it's 14 winter, so when you go around in a sort of a small courtyard to walk, you have to put something underneath your clothes as much as you get completely freezing, so I had those. And the other shoes I had were, were, was, uh, were the uh, rubber flip-flops. So I would go to the shower. T-shirt, long johns, and rubber flip-flops. Exactly. Okay. So that's all I had. And the, uh, this lieutenant colonel said, why don't you have any normal civilian clothes? And I said, look, man, I'm serving a 25 year sentence in solitary confinement in a strict regime prison in Siberia. What would I need civilian clothes for? He had nothing to respond to that. I said, okay, put, put, put that on. 
So I put on my mom's Jones t shirt and flip flops. I was told to take my bag. And I was escorted downstairs. And there was, again, and this is, I keep coming back to the movie, it was a movie. There was a row of men in black, 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 black faces standing. It's a pretty intimidating sign. Just a small, you know, small space rise. I saw a small face cover with a black, 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 in um, civilian clothes. This was an FSB special unit. And they told me to go outside into the internal prison courtyard. And I was a bus parked in there. And they told me to, to get up there. And I got into the bus, and it's totally dark. There's no light on. The windows are tinted black. And in every row of that bus were more ballot cloud covered, black ballot cloud covered FSB special union operatives. And next to each of them, I saw a friend, a colleague, a fellow political prisoner. The first person I saw was Oliver Wolf from Memorial, from the Human Rights Activist. Uh, the second person I saw was my friend and colleague, uh, Andre Pivovar, the former director of Open Russia, who I think he was at this conference and maybe in this room. And the third person I saw was uh, Lydia Yash, uh, the position politician for most of the legislature. We'd all been serving time in different regions of Russia in different places. Uh, um, and there was only, there could only be one reason for us all to be on the same bus. That was the one I That's the very last one. Yeah. I'm going to read some.